just wanted to say a few things, inshallah ta'ala. Um, just some words of advice. ad din al this is hadith of the Prophet um, So, uh, one thing I want to say is, um, and I think, you know, the general topic is around sort of understanding the times we live in. And there's a very vast corpus of hadith literature um, that deals with signs of the sa'a, right? In the hadith of Jibril alayhi salam, which is a foundational hadith in our tradition, absolutely foundational. Hadith Jibril alayhi salam. It's found in Bukhari and Muslim, Imam and Nawawi uh, quotes it as number two hadith in his Arba'in. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi uh, is approached by Jibril alayhi salam, um, who comes in the form of a man. And this is how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi would receive wahi. Uh, Imam al-Shafi'i said that the forms of wahi are 46 types, and this is just one type in which the angel would take the form of a human being and come to the Prophet sallallahu In this case, it says that Jibril alayhi salam, he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi he had exceedingly black hair, he had very, very white clothes. Uh, he did not have signs of travel on him. He wasn't disheveled, no dirt on his clothes, nothing like that. No knapsack. And none of us knew who he was. So he sits in front of the Prophet and then he begins to, in a sense, interrogate the Prophet and he says, Islam. Tell me about Islam. You know the hadith? You should know this hadith. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he gives him the five pillars of Islam. Buryan Islamu ala khams. Right? Islam is built on five. The shahada, that there's no ilah, there's no deity, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that we pray. And for a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of modern Muslims, that's plenty for them. I believe in God, I do my prayer. Or I just believe in God this type of thing. So the prayer is absolutely fundamental. Right? I can't stress this enough. The first thing we're going to be asked about in the Yom al Qiyamah, according to the hadith of the Prophet uh, is our prayer. The Prophet وسلم, in his final appearance in the masjid, he said, as salah as salah the prayer, the prayer. Right? Um, so, and there's a hadith where he says, وسلم, that the difference between a mu'min and a kafir is as salah the prayer. And most of the ulama, they take this as sort of a qualitative difference between a mu'min and a kafir. In other words, if a mu'min, if a Muslim is not praying, then he's taking on sort of the characteristics of a kafir. But Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, he said, no, he's a kafir in essence. It's an essential difference, right? And Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal is one of the great a'imma of Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah. So we should take these opinions very, very seriously. So our prayer should be the focus of our life. Right? Really be the focus of our life. Plan your day around the prayer. If you want to go see, you know, The Last Jedi, but, you know, and, and, you know the days are short, and then you're going to miss Asr and Maghrib, but you know, make it up later. Then, you know, every day we should be improving. One of my teachers said, if you're not a better person than you were yesterday, then you failed. Every day you should make progress. And, we have, and it's an inward struggle. It's a, it's a constant struggle. We should we should be conscious of our thoughts, right? We should be in a state of toba. Um, you know, one of my teachers said, "Be in one of two states." A state of toba, which is repentance, and a state of shukur, which is gratitude. And this is something that again is lost on a lot of modern people. Just to be in a state of gratitude, right? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Fath kuruni al kurkum." And this is sort of a a purpose clause in Arabic. If you have regard for me, uh, have regard for me so that I might have regard for you. Sometimes it's translated, remember me so that I might remember you. Probably not a good translation because it sort of implies that there, the opposite might be true of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he'll forget, but he doesn't forget. So dhikr could mean to have regard for something. Have regard for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that he might have regard for us. In other words, put us in the center of his providence, of his tawfiq. Right? In the Quran, oftentimes, this is one of the rhetorical sort of secrets of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses something in, in uh, classical English grammar, it's called parataxis, 
which is a ju juxtaposition of opposite ideas, right? You find this in the Quran, with like jinn and ins, for example, samawati wal ard, opposites put in juxtaposition. So the ulama say this is what's happening in this in this part of the ayah. Washkuruli wala takfurun. Have shukur, be grateful to me, and do not disbelieve in me. So then kufur and shukur are opposites. You see? Kufur and shukur are opposites. In other words, uh, to be ungrateful is a form of kufur to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is a form of disbelief. Right? So one of the ways in which we manifest shukur or gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is a shakir, is one of his names, a shakur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who appreciates service. Right? So this is one of the names of Allah. When when we manifest the attribute of a shakir, it means we are thankful to Allah. But the shakur is the one who thanks Allah even when he's deprived. This is a higher level of shukur. Right? Because ultimately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's good for us. And according to our limited wisdom, we might think, well, that thing was good for me. Why, why didn't Allah give it to me? But this is imputing upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our own sense of reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hikmah is infinite and absolute. In reality, we don't know what is ultimately good for us. Something that ostensibly is is seen as evil from our perspective or unjust might actually be something that's good for us in the sort of long run. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is outside of time, right? Uh, he created time. He's not in time. He trans transcends space-time and matter. Um, so the shakur is the one who thanks Allah even when he's deprived and even in times of adver adversity. أَفَلَا أَكُنُوا عَبْدًا shakura. Right? The Prophet ﷺ, when he was praying a third of the night uh, and you know his feet were swollen and our mother Aisha anha, she said, why do you do this? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven, has forgiven your past and future transgressions and the transgression of a Prophet is completely different than a transgression of one of us. We don't have time to go into that. It's a theological issue. But his response was, أَفَلَا أَكُنُوا عَبْدًا shakura." Shall I not be a grateful servant? And he was a shakur. One who's constantly in the process of thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any state. Right? This is important. And that we carry, if we complain, we complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? A lot of times now, youngsters, they want to complain about things and how things are bad in the world and how bad we've got it. I mean, just take inventory, do a self-audit. Is it really that bad? Is your life really that bad? You really want to march out into the streets and shout at people and wave signs at people, right? One of my teachers said, you know, you better make sure that the evil is really out there before you do that. Whenever you want to mention the faults of others, remember your own fault first. Uh, whoever uh, whoever uh, humbles himself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will exalt and raise up. Whoever raises himself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will debase and humiliate. Right? So the Prophet sallallahu in our sort of state is analogous to the Prophet in Mecca. Muslim minority and a non-Muslim majority. Right? So we need to study the Meccan period. Study the tafsir. How did the Prophet sallallahu handle himself in the Meccan period. He was a victim in Mecca, right? He was a victim of verbal and physical abuse. He was oppressed. They were tyrannical towards him. He went to Ta'if. He was stoned out of the city. And he carried his complaint to Allah. He didn't complain to the people. The beautiful dua which he made while his feet were bleeding, sitting under a tree, Allahumma ashku ilika da'fa quwwati, is how he started his dua. This is incredible. The entire dua is really incredible. Just the first part, he says, Oh Allah, I complain to you about my weakness of strength. So he doesn't say, I complain to you because what you did to me. I'm complaining to you, you know, because you put me with this group of people who's, who stoned me out of the city. So he attributes the weakness, his shortcomings to himself. This is called tawadur. This is called humility. Right? 
So the prayer reinforces that. The prayer has many functions. Anyway, back to the after this long tangent. After the, back to the hadith of Jibril So the prayer and then charity, right? Hajjan and fasting. These are the five pillars. And then Jibreel alayhi salam says to him, tell me about Iman. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi he tells him the six articles of faith. And then tell me about Ihsan, uh, spiritual excellence, if you will, or goodness. And he said to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you can see him. And if you can't see him, you should be cognizant, or fully aware that indeed he sees you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you. Right? This is Ihsan. And then the hadith continues. Tell me about the sa'a. Right? Tell me about the hour. Man masulu uh, he says, uh, Man anha The one being questioned knows no more than the questioner. No one knows the sa'a. So whoever gives you a date, that person is a liar. Some years back there was a Christian preacher. Who said, what did he say? May 21st, 2012. And then people, you know, they sold their their entire life because they thought they were going to be raptured into heaven. And, and then he said, oh, you know what? I miscalculated. It's actually in October. <laughs> so we can have the summer. When October comes around, you know, it's just, it's not, it's not happening. I'm going to stop predicting. So no one knows the Sa'a. Right? The Prophet said, I don't know. No. The one being questioned knows more than the questioner. So he said, Tell me about its portents and amaratiha. So the Prophet said, he mentioned a few things. The first thing he mentioned in the hadith of Jibreel, he said, That a, a girl will give birth to her master or mistress. A girl will give birth to her master, which is very interesting. Right? This idea of empowering children. This idea that there's the just or the ideal society is one in which there is absolutely uh, perfect egalitarianism. That hierarchical structures are seen as oppressive. And this is a kind of philosophy that's sort of being pumped out of American universities in the academy. Right? Our children that go to these colleges are being taught um, an epistemology known as postmodernism, that every type of traditional society or belief system is inherently oppressive. This is what they're taught. Right? You take a philosophy class, you take a psychology class, you take an English class, it's almost unavoidable. Every type of traditional uh, belief system, every type, is inherently tyrannical and oppressive and it must be taken off the face of the earth, and we need to rebuild society again. Even traditional religious values are seen as oppressive. They study people like Nietzsche, a German philosopher, whom Hitler made the official philosopher of the Third Reich. Nietzsche said that compassion is a vice. Compassion is bad for you. Right? Which is interesting because this is the core virtue in our tradition. Is compassion. Is rahman. Ar-Rahimuna yarhamukum ar-Rahman irhamu man fil ard yarhamukum man fil sama yarhamukum man fil sama. That the most compassionate shows compassion to those who show compassion. Show compassion to those on earth and the one in heaven. Uh, in no anthropomorphic way, they say that he's shayun, and the one in heaven will show you compassion. Absolutely fundamental, right? And so uh, our, our children are being taught that these are all sort of, in, you know, they sort of frame it as this is a Christian value, but those are values that we also, we also believe in, right? Compassion is a, is, is, and what's interesting is Friedrich Nietzsche, his, his final sane act on earth was he was walking in the streets of Turin, this is very ironic, and he saw a man beating his horse, and then he ran and he hugged the horse, and there's tears in his eyes, and, and then he went into a total state of insanity for two or three years. Very ironic that his final act on earth was an act of compassion. Right? But this is what we need to do. We need to get rid of these religious, these archaic, these old-fashioned values, and come up with our own values. 
right? So we need to destroy what they call the patriarchy. This is how they refer to it, especially third wave feminists, right? The patriarchy has got to go. What's the patriarchy? Who's the patriarch? Ibrahim alayhi salam. So they're taught a narrative. Here's the narrative. Before these archaic and tyrannical and oppressive Abrahamic religions, the world was living in a state of utopia. Right? And it's, you know, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity that came and disrupted the utopia. Some of them actually believe, you take classes in gender studies and things like that, that before Abraham, women just ruled the world, is what they're taught. It's a mythos, it's not true. It's only true in Hollywood. It's called Wonder Woman. <laughs> and the place is not real, it's called the Amazon. But in our tradition, we're taught that women need men, and men need women. It's a compliment. It's not a competition, right? So, you know, this idea of postmodernism. So things that are traditional beliefs are seen to be things that are sort of outdated, right? For example, they say um, gender itself is just a, it's a social construct, right? You ever heard this before? There's nothing biological about gender. You can arbitrarily change your gender. This is what they're being taught. That there's a difference between sex and gender. You're born into a sex, male or female, but gender is something that is socialized. It's all nurture. Of course, there's no scientific evidence of this. But a way of sort of creating this egalitarian type of society where there's no differences whatsoever. And it's interesting to see this sort of, ra ra uh, sort of outcome of this type of philosophy. You know, because now it's, it's permeating into things like, um, like uh, college sports or professional sports. If you can just arbitrarily change your gender, I can wake up tomorrow and I, I can say, you know what, I'm a woman today. And I'm going to play on the women's basketball team. Well, of course, I'd still be terrible. I'm not a very good basketball player. But imagine someone like LeBron James decides, oh, I feel like a woman. And then he joins the WNBA. They'll say, yeah, he's a, he's a woman. There's no, there's, there's, there's no such thing as gender, is what they say. And a lot of children, they have what's known as gender dysphoria. Right? So children, because St. Adi said that that childhood is a type of junun, it's a type of insanity. That's why they're children. They need to be manipulated, for lack of a better term. So children, they, many of them start acting like the other gender. And you have these parents who say, yeah, these are now our teachers. You know, Johnny wants to be a girl. I'm old-fashioned. Johnny knows what he's doing. These are now our teachers. This is your teacher? The same kid who put on Mickey Mouse ears? and you know, Now he wants to be a girl? So what if, the, what if your child wants to be a mouse? You're going to give them mouse hormones? And, no. The intellect is not developed, but you have parents that are now giving their children, you know, hormone therapy that's sterilizing them. And then 80% of children actually come out of this gender dysphoria. 80% of them. It's a phase. But we're being taught that gender doesn't really exist. Okay? And that men and women are absolutely the same. Now, if you look at our Sharia, you know, there's no absolute equality. There's, there's equitable rules for men and women. Because men and women are different. Physically, they're different. You know, why do women pray behind men? This is a big affront to postmodernists. They come inside of a masjid. What is this? Women should pray next to men in front of men. Men and women are different. We have different hard wiring. Physically, we're different. That's true, right? Um, but even our our rods and cones and our eyes interact with light differently. And men are more. Um, they're more visually oriented, right? So I got this question the other day in another masjid with a large non-Muslim audience. Why do women pray behind the men? It's because men are easily distracted from the prayer. And men know what I'm talking about. This is just a fact, right? Islam is dealing with reality. 
You know, so we don't have absolute egalitarianism. What we're looking for are things that are equitable, things that are fair. So, for example, polygamy. You know, people bring that issue up. <laughs> Why can't I have four husbands? Okay, but a man must support his wife. Right? It doesn't matter if she has a PhD or she's an MD. If she decides, you know what, I'm not going to work. You go work. She has that right. Right? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and he knows that there's differences amongst us. Now what's interesting is, if you look at European studies, so Europeans in general are not very religious people. Right? There's a study that came out of Prague University in the Czech Republic. And some of these countries are like 80% atheists. Right? And they're very homogenous. Basically you have a bunch of tall white people. Right? So you can't you sort of go, well, you know, there's there's religious baggage, there's cultural baggage, but people are basically the same. This in, is interesting study, Prague, you know, I'm sorry, Charles University in Prague, where they found that uh, amongst married couples, when one spouse is dominant in the relationship, and dominant, not dominant in the sense of oppressive, dominant in the sense that they sort of have the final say on things, right? They found that in those relationships, they have more children and they're much happier than when you have two dominant spouses competing for power. The study also found you can't blame religion. These are not religious people. You can't, oh, this is, you know, some Middle Eastern cultural baggage. No, these are people that live the Czech Republic. Right? They found that 78% of those relationships were male-dominated. Male dominated. So it's interesting, you have studies done by non-Muslims, by people who are not religious, um, that demonstrate, the data proves, that when a man is dominant in the relationship, those couples tend to be happier. Uh, this is sort of the normal state of human beings. We shouldn't apologize for it. There's studies out there that back this. It doesn't mean that, you know, women are inferior to men or something like that. But they're compliments, you know. So um, uh, it's important for us to articulate our tradition to people. Because eventually, because, you know, Muslims, they tend to align themselves with the left, right? Because they don't want anything to do with Trump, and he's a Republican, right? But if you look at, if you look at our religious beliefs, you look at our values, we probably have more in common, when it really comes down to it, with Sarah Palin than we do with Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton is, believes in uh, social construction. Gender is a social construct. Okay? For example, she says, I wish we could have a woman president. Yet she believes that if Donald Trump wakes up tomorrow and says, I feel like a woman, we have a woman president. Okay? But that won't be good enough for her. She says, we have to keep abortion safe, legal, and rare. Why rare? She says, oh, the, ba the baby's not, the fetus is not a baby. They don't like to use the word baby. It's just a bundle of cells. Then why should it be rare? If it's like removing a polyp from your colon, who cares? Just get rid of it. Because they know it's wrong. That's why. So you look down at, you really analyze, right, uh, what's happening as far as uh, what people actually believe, right? It's, it's very revelatory. And I think, uh, right now, um, the greatest challenge to us is not the Christian right, it's not, you know, fundamentalist Jews, um, it's not religious people, really. It's this idea, this attack on tradition that's coming out of philosophies like postmodernism, like nominalism. Nominalism teaches there's no essence to anything, it's all accidents. There's no essences, right? Um, uh, this type of thing. Uh, and, and so, and so when, when children you know, or teenagers, they go to high school, they go to college, and they're exposed to these types of things, it's very hard for them to find guidance through the Muslim Ummah, unfortunately. But I think it's, it's time for us to defend our tradition, and it can be defended well. Um, because the Prophet said, you know, he said, at the end of time, لا يبقى من الإسلام إلا اسمه. Nothing will remain of this religion except its name. What does that mean? There are some people who believe that you can define this religion as Islam 
by your feelings. Right? Whatever I feel like, that's what it is. Well then, how do you interpret this hadith? Nothing will remain of the religion except its name. This hadith indicates there's a normative definition of Islam. And there's something else postmoderns don't believe in. Something normative, something orthodox. Right? There's nothing normative, they say. There's nothing normal, they say. Right? This hadith indicates there's a normative definition. It's not defined by our feelings. It's defined by Allah and His Messenger. There will come a time when people will say, I'm Muslim, but there's nothing Islamic about them. Because they've redefined their religion. Right? Sometimes we have to use secular arguments. Because you appeal to scripture, it's, it's fallacy. It's an appeal to unqualified authority. Somebody says to you, for example, um, why don't you agree with homosexuality? You say, well, the Quran says that it's a sin. Well, I don't believe in some text that was written, you know, thousands of years ago. It's important for us to use uh, secular type arguments, according to the CDC, the Center of Disease Control. And I apologize in advance. One third of gay men are incontinent. You can look that word up later. 50,000 people every year get HIV. 78% of them are 2% of the population. That is completely unacceptable. And that is an epidemic, and that's absolutely insane when you think about it. Facts from the CDC. Facts hurt your feelings. I don't care. Those are facts. We can have a good discussion about them. But this is what it is. And we shouldn't apologize for our faith. Because we believe that our faith... And, you know, people, people sometimes, they want us to use sort of their terminology for things. Right? We have to respect their tradition, but why isn't our tradition respected? Like this whole movement about gender pronouns. People are not picking their own pronouns. Apparently there's more than two genders, there's more than two types of pronouns. You go to some of these classes, and they say, what, what pronoun do you prefer? You, Excuse me? What pronoun? What are the choices? He, she, she, he, the, they, what? Oh, I didn't, I didn't know that. And they, and they, Enforce it upon you have to use my pronoun. So I don't I have my own religious beliefs. I have my own anthropo anthropological beliefs about what a human being is, and I believe that there's two genders. Right? I'm a gender binary, if you will. Well you're you're a transphobe then. You're you're a racist or you're full of hate, you're a bigot. Why? Because I want to because I believe in something, because I want to uphold my religious beliefs. And it's like this one time uh, I was tutoring a student and she put her hand out to sh shake my hand and I just put my hand over my heart and I said, oh, I don't, I don't shake hands with women. And she said, what? <laughs> and, and she said, I'm so offended. Right? And, uh, and she said, uh, and I said, you're offended by what? I'm so offended you won't shake my hand. And I said, oh, my religious beliefs offend you? I'm offended that you're offended. Oh, okay. Yeah. Or it's like one time I was in a PhD seminar class, and we are talking about some cultural practice in a different country that I found to be absolutely disgusting. And I voiced that in class. I said, I think that's just totally disgusting. And, uh, a liberal student jumped all over me and said, how dare you? How dare you make a judgment about another culture? Who the heck do you think you are? You think you're so much better. How dare you make a judgment about another culture and, and judge that person and, and demean their opinion? And I said, what are you doing to me right now? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah. But it's really interesting. They don't they don't they don't they don't flip it on themselves and see what that basically it's all hypocrisy. This should be our stance. We should be principled. The Prophet in Mecca was principled. His methodology was called assertive nonviolence. Assertive nonviolence means to be totally nonviolent. No violence. But assertive meaning discipline, principle. Right? The Prophet did not compromise in theology and morality. He didn't compromise. And it would have made the situation a lot better if he had done that. But he said, No, I'm not compromising. Because he wants to honor Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
I read a book one time by an anti-Muslim polemicist, this guy who hated Islam, and he quoted this ayah, he said, this is the most tolerant verse in the Quran, <laughs> interestingly enough, in Surah Al-Kafirun. <laughs> you have your way, I have my way. Don't impose your beliefs on me. This is the Meccan period. You know, you want to use your pronouns, you want to call yourself this and that, you can be an elephant for all I care. I don't care. But don't expect me to go along with it. You have your religion, I have my religion. You have your religious beliefs or lack thereof. You don't believe in anything, good for you. For man sha'afa yu'min, wa man sha'afa yakfur. The Quran says to it, the kaf, mekin ayah. Whoever wants to believe, let him believe. Whoever wants to disbelieve, let him disbelieve. Do whatever you want. Right? You have your religion, I have my religion. Right? And so, this is not going to be good enough. Eventually, when we align ourselves with people on the left, the extreme left, there's, there's, there's my way or the highway, really, with them. Right? Uh, but interestingly enough, with Christians and Jews, they understand that there's believers and there's non-believers. There's going to be people who don't agree with you. And this is how to deal with them, with compassion, with tolerance. Right? Um, so the Prophet wasallam is our model. The Meccan period, assertive non-violence. When they threw garbage on him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he went home, wrapped himself in his mantle, he laid down. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him, the Jibreel alayhi salam descended, Ya ayyuhal mudathir, O you wrapped up in the mantle, Qum, get on your feet. Right? Fa'anthir, and go and warn them. Right? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, Allah is, is, is teaching him, don't victimize yourself, don't make yourself into a victim. Oftentimes we do this, and you know I, I I've said this before that I used to go to masajid, I used to go to churches and synagogues, and I used to have interfaith dialogue, and people genuinely wanted to know about our faith, and I would talk about you know Isa alayhi salam and the Quran and the Prophet sallallahu and the Bible and whatnot. Now it's just Muslims going into churches and just complaining about everything, complaining. You know. I, I was in the, the Trader Joe's or the Safeway, I was at McDonald's, and somebody said, you're a camel jockey. <laughs> and then everyone goes, oh, yeah, poor me. I mean, how many times has that really happened? You really need to announce that? You have an opportunity to talk to non-Muslims. You can, you can say the name Muhammad sallam, in front of non-Muslims. You can put a hadith of the Prophet sallam. Wallahi, one time I was in a church, and then there was like 10 speakers, and the lady said, you have one minute to say something. I quoted one hadith of the Prophet There's This girl in the audience, she came with crying like this. She was running to hug me like, oh, that is so beautiful. We're like this, running to hug me. And I saw a Muslim sister in hijab. I said, get in front of me, get in front of me. And so she was hugging the Muslim sister, but she was looking at me. Oh. But you know, oh, this is, I mean, yeah, I mean, think, think about what's happening in the society. Is it really a big problem? Are you really a victim? I'll tell you right now, I've been to many Muslim-majority countries, and I've experienced more racism than some of these countries. I've been barred from going into places, literally, in Muslim-majority countries. Or, you know, eventually sort of let in after hours and hours of... This never happened to me here. So we have to put things in perspective, right? Don't victimize yourself. The Prophet says, wrapped himself, boom, get on your feet. Fa'anthir, go back out there and warn people. Now, the, what does it mean to be a nadir, a warner? It means to, 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 to make people aware of a harm, right? So the Prophet says, was just victimized. Allah is telling them, Allah is telling him, go back out there and warn them about this harm. In essence, continue to be compassionate to them. Continue to be compassionate, even though they've abused you. And magnify your Lord. While you're doing that, say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And clean your clothes off. They put dirt on you, you are going to take it off. Don't lie down and say, well, I'm going to wait till somebody pulls me back up and cleans me back off, because I've been victimized. This is not what the Prophet did. Stood back up, went out there, Clean himself off. 
وَبْرُوْتِ زَفَهْجُرْ And shun their immorality and idolatry. Be principled. Take a principled stance. Stance. Good. A man came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, قُلْ لِي فِي الْإِسْلَامِ قَوْلًا لَا أَسْأَلُ عَنْهُ أَحَدًا غَيْرًا Tell me something about Islam that only you can tell me. Give me something that only you can tell me. Something special. The Prophet said, قُلْ أَمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ Say, I believe in Allah and have istiqama, uprightness. Be upright, be strong upon that. That's it, that's the entire answer. Right? Life is too short to be a sellout. Don't sell out. For what? To make a few people happy in your class? Okay? So, you know, be wary of different types of philosophies and teachings that our children might be exposed to in, in now even in high school, right? Where difference of opinion is absolutely not tolerated anymore. There's one philosophy, this is what it is. If you don't believe in this, you're a bigot, you're a racist, you're an archaic sort of traditionalist, and your and your entire um, belief system has to go. Right? So we should be able to reason with that. I think I'll stop with my rant. <laughs> But I take some questions at all. Which hadith? The hadith in the chair. Oh, the hadith was um. لا تدخل الجنة حتى تؤمن ولا تؤمن حتى تحب. That's it. None of you believe. None of you enter paradise until you believe, and none of you believe until you love one another. And then I said, and, and then I said, and the Prophet said to his companions. Shall I tell you of something that will increase love? And they said, yes. And he said, Afshu salam Spread peace amongst yourself. And I sat down. That was the, the only thing I said. You have an opportunity to speak to people. You know, people out there are have living <coughs> traumatic lives. They need something that you have, really. You know. And you'll be uh, surprised the reaction you get. Yes, sir? Can you finish the hadith that you started with? Oh. And then he said, so he said a, a, a woman will give birth to her master, and then you will see the naked, destitute, barefoot shepherds competing in the construction of tall buildings, which is an indication, according to the Urnama, of sort of a competition in Prabhupada Dunya, in Dunya, basically. And that's the end of the hadith, and then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and then Jibreel alayhi wa goes away, and he says, Ya Umar, atadri man is sad, you know, the questioner. The questioner was, is Allah wa Rasulullah a'lam, Allah and his messenger know best. He said, that was Jibreel alayhi wa was come to you to teach your religion. And that's the end of the hadith. So he gave two signs. One of them, according to the ulama, uh, will happen quickly, like, hukukul walidain, right, filial recalcitrance, disrespect of parents by children. And then the other one is going to come later, uh, down the line. Huh? Um, so earlier on you were saying don't really like listen to other people's cultures and just kind of stick to your own culture. But why not listen to their culture and point out the flaws and show how your culture is superior? Um, so I said that don't listen to other people's... So you're saying like when people would come up to you and say, oh, um, there should be more than two genders and you kind of say, let me have my beliefs and you have yours. Mm. Why not listen to their beliefs and then point out the flaws of their beliefs? Yeah, you can if you want to. That's what I've been saying is interact with people on the basis of, of reason and use secular arguments. Don't use religious arguments because they're not going to work with people that don't believe in the sacredness of text. That was my whole point when I pointed out uh, the problem with homosexuality. The social impact of that is detrimental to society. So giving an answer of, oh, I, you know, I just don't believe in it because the Quran says, so that's fine for you, but that's not going to work for the other people, for the other person. And if you don't want to talk to the other person, that's fine also. You don't have to say anything. Right? But I think we need to have, you know, like they bring conservative speakers, for example, to UC Berkeley, and then people show up and they riot and they break windows. Let them speak. And you can just bring your speaker and they can refute their points. Right? Stopping someone's speech is not the right answer. Right? It's fundamentally opposed to what this country stands for. They say, well, you know, in, in my opinion, well, your opinion is irrelevant. Let people have their beliefs. Let them do whatever they want, as long as it doesn't break the laws of the country. 
and then you can lawfully uh, debate their positions. Right? But you'll learn a lot from people that you think you disagree with. And this is very difficult for the youth to have the discipline to listen to someone who has a difference of opinion. It's very hard. The Prophet says, actually a hadith that says part of a person's muru'ah or maturity is listening to a different opinion and not interrupting that person. It's a function of a person's maturity. Right? Because all we do now, for the most part, is ad hominem. You don't agree with someone? Oh, you're an idiot or you're a bigot. That's called ad hominem attack. Right? It's just an insult. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a real argument. Right? Or people are so easily triggered now. Right? They have this, these trigger warnings in college. You, can do, you go into a college, right? you go into a classroom, you'll get a trigger warning, trigger warning. Um, and they make some statement and then some children, the kids freak out, they have to go to a safe space. Where there's Play Doh, you can play video games. Because they can't hear another opinion. It's very strange. They actually have these rooms called safe spaces in colleges, universities. Where children go and they, and they sort of, you know, they meditate because I was triggered as a, as a microaggression against me because this person said something that I disagree with. You know, it's a very strange culture now. We should be able to hear different opinions and process them. I mean, that's sort of the point of college anyway, is to hear different opinions and be able to deal with them rationally. Yes? What would be the uh, appropriate Islamic response or reaction to hate speech like that? Reaction to hate speech? Yeah. If you were in the audience and there was a, mm. a hate speech, what would be the appropriate Islamic Get up and leave. That's it. Yeah, remove yourself from that situation. Just take leave of them. If you want to make a sort of a silent scene, you know, just kind of go and walk out. Just remove yourself from that situation. Because the problem is, there are a lot of provocateurs out there. In other words, there are people actually go up on stage and they actually want to produce some sort of reaction from Muslims specifically. So I'll go up there and say some slanderous thing about the Prophet of Allah, said them. And then a Muslim, of course, will be like, oh, and, and then they'll kind of lose their mind and they'll let anger, and then, oh, look, see, this is what I'm talking about. These people hate our democracy. They hate our First Amendment. Right? So don't attend it. If you want to attend, have the discipline to sit there and listen to something, and then write a refutation. The pen is mightier than the sword. You know? So we should be in positions where, I mean, use social media. You know, use, use you know, journalistic avenues. Do something, but do it in a way that is, that is tempered, a way that is civil. Right? But a lot of these people are just trying to get a reaction. One of the best things we can do is just completely ignore it, just downplay it. It'll just fizzle and go away. Okay. I mean, the Prophet says, that's, that's his sunnah in Mecca, when, when the mushrikeen were slandering him, they were calling him the opposite of the name Muhammad. There's, it, was, it sounds like the Prophet's name, but it means the opposite of his name. And the Sahaba were so upset about this. They came to the Prophet, can we attack people that call you this? He said, what are they saying? They're calling you Mudammam. He said, who is that? I am Muhammad. And everyone kind of chuckled. That's it. He didn't allow himself to be triggered. Say, what? That's what they're saying. Where's Omar? Go deal with this guy. Go deal with this guy. Well, like the Prophet said, was sitting like this one time, and he's eating something, and not a Muslim woman passed by. She said, this is your Prophet? He eats like an abd, like a slave. Your prophet eats like a slave? And the Sahaba stopped. And he said, Alas to be abd? Am I not a slave? Am I not a slave? Continued with this. That's it? She walked away. Everyone laughed at her. Okay. Don't take these things so seriously. These are nothing. Absolutely nothing. You know. <clears throat> Go about your business. Life is too short. Take care of your family. There are people that are angry with their wives like four or five days. Now, life is too short for that. People that love you, you're angry with them? Why? You know, people haven't talked to their fathers in weeks. For what? It's ajib. Ajib and gharib. A person will shun his father and cling to his friend. Other signs of Isa. Right? A person will ignore his mother and obey his wife. Nothing wrong with being congenial with, his, with your wife. The point is shunning your mother. Right? These, these are fitan that come. Towards the end of time, um, 
But we have to have sort of develop a thick skin. The Prophet Sallallahu in Mecca developed a thick skin because ultimately he knew who was in charge. Right? We have belief in Qadr, something that happened in the past. You can't do anything about it. That's the will of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Don't dwell on it. Move on. Is there a question over here? There's one there. Yes, sir. Yes, if you uh, on a similar note, you know, all of the. There's a discussion discussing about, you know, let's say a uh, <coughs> sister wearing a hijab and then, you know, uh, insulted in the mall or any of this. What is a better way to react? If a sister gets assaulted at the mall? And it's just like, you know, you know people you know, insulting you know, Oh, insult. Insult, yeah. Yeah. The ghafwan. It means to pretend to be, to have ghafla. Just don't even acknowledge it. This is the Sunnah practice. Your insult is not even worth your time. You know, just walk right by. If they get in your face and things like that, then, you know, try to remove yourself from that situation as much as possible. But again, a lot of people they want to get a reaction. People have their phones out. You never know. Some guys over there trying to get you to get angry. His buddies over there recording. He's going to post it on some uh, YouTube channel. He has a million uh, subscribers or something. Muslim goes crazy in mall, and he doesn't show the first part where he like punches you in the stomach or something, or calls you some name. He just gets you reacting. Ah! I kill you! <laughs> just remove yourself from that situation. Yeah. Uh -huh. Just an observation, actually. You know, the current administration. You know, I feel like as Muslims, you know, our name constantly tarnished and. Uh, I'm kind of just really voicing my opinion in terms of how can we improve our image as Muslims to show what really Islam is, you know, especially with the people who are ignorant of it and they only see on TV, you know, which is things which should not portray Islam in the right way. I feel like there's need more from our um, Islamic society in this country to do more maybe on TVs. I, I don't really know the answer, but just an observation. I feel like our image especially with the current administration, being tarnished as Muslims. Yeah. And, you know, it's something we need to kind of uh, really see a way to just to show what our true image is. I think the best thing is just be Muslim. Just be a practicing Muslim. If you try to infiltrate the media, good luck with that. Because the media is a function of the government, and the government has to justify, you know, Israeli occupation and invasion of foreign countries and and it's all the same spin on every channel. It's very, very difficult to make headway. I mean, you can have like a, a YouTube channel or something like that. You can create an alternative sort of news network, but it's going to be a slow process. And th these things actually work. There, there are a lot of people that are, have actually made a name for themselves uh, creating these channels that are challenging, you know, the sort of mainstream media. But MSN, mainstream media, it's, it's all the same sort of prepackaged garbage. Um, I would say just, just be about Islam. And people eventually, they're watching these things on TV, eventually they're going to meet someone like you, you might have a Muslim neighbor, Muslim friend, and there's going to be a cognitive dissonance. This is what this guy on TV is telling me, this suit on TV, and this is a Muslim guy that I know, and he's nothing like this. And people begin the great awakening. They're already starting to wake up. So, that's the best, I mean, just be Muslim. Be a principled Muslim. And it doesn't mean that you have to you know, give speeches and whatnot in the subway or something. Just be, be, a, be a practicing Muslim. Um, you know, a, a smile or something like that. So that, a very friendly gesture. Go open the door for somebody. But now, it was interesting. I, I, was, I was on a bar train. And <laughs> this lady came in and I got up to give her my seat. And she said, I don't need your seat. <laughs> Do I look weak to you or something like that? No, I said, well, I don't know. taking gender studies, so you got to be careful. <laughs> they try to be chivalrous and they shut, they shut you down. You know, it's very IG. You know. But again, you know, gender is a social construct, right? You know, there's an MA, there's an MA, what's it called? Mixed martial arts, MMA fighter, who's a man, biologically, fighting women and sending them to the hospital <laughs> and no one can say anything because they don't want to be labeled as a bigot because they believe there's really no difference between those. She took hormones. 
Yeah, but the whole skeletal frame is bigger. There's denser muscle. Her fists are like this big. Huge cranium. But that's a man. Like beating up these women. And it's going into the Olympics now. Now you have, you know, you know, track and field people that are born men, racing women, completely destroying them. And you see the women in the back who have lost the race, and their face is just like, I can't say anything about it. They're going to label me a bigot. Because they refuse to acknowledge that there's differences between men and women. It doesn't mean one is better than the other. But there are differences. Our brains work differently. We remember things differently. You know, we, we excel in different areas. This is just a, it's just a fact. Again, look at European studies, Scandinavian studies, that prove that women have a sort of predisposition towards certain careers, and so do men. You know, women tend to go into uh, medicine uh, and teaching. Men go into the STEM fields. These are studies coming out of irreligious societies in Scandinavia. You can't blame religious baggage. But this is our hard wiring. People refuse to acknowledge it. Because they want absolute egalitarianism. So my son is at the same level as me. Right? Everyone's the same. You know, everyone at work should be the same. Everything the same. You know, they want to create this egalitarian utopia on earth that's not going to exist. You can never have perfect justice in the dunya. It's impossible. Perfect justice is, is for Yom al -Qiyama. And you don't want justice on Yom al -Qiyama. We want Rahma on Yom al -Qiyama. It's why we believe in Yom al -Qiyama. But people who only believe in this dunya, they try to create their utopia here. It doesn't work. Mao tried it, Stalin tried it, Pol Pot tried it. It doesn't work. You're going to end up killing millions and millions of people. Right? So, obviously, there's a place for protest. But we really have to be self-checking first. We really have anything to complain about. Yeah, maybe there's a few things. But, you know, we should check ourselves. And that's the answer to the question, is that if you just implement, you know, the, the sunnah in our lives, inshallah, we'll see vast improvement. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can change opinions like this. You know, like the, the sister said, when Muhammad Ali passed away, rahimahullah ta'ala, and his funeral was in Louisville, Kentucky. It was a Muslim sister in hijab. She said she landed at the airport. As soon as she walked out into the airport, people were giving her a standing ovation just because she was a Muslim. And then like two days later, there was some, one of these shootings or whatever, and they blamed the Muslims. And all of that went away. And one of my teachers said, you see what Allah can do? Like this, he can change hearts and then bring it back again. It's just an evidence of the, of the qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He can change it easy, change all perceptions. But sitting around and, and just sort of, it's all tamanna. Tamanna means like vain hope with no action. Amlil insani man tamanna. Shall I give man whatever he desires? Right? You know, we have raja. Raja is hope with action. Hope for something, but you're taking action. What is the difference between raja and tamanna? The person who has tamanna is sitting in his mother's basement. He's a 40-year-old man. He's playing video games. And he's thinking, Dua, I wish I had a job. I wish I had a wife. I wish I lost 200 pounds. But he doesn't take any action towards it. He's making Dua. But the one who has raja is fa'il, is, is active. Right? Muslim, ism fa'il, an active participle. He's doing the best he can. Right? And if he falls short, he makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to complete his action. They give him tawfiq. At least he tried his best. Thank you very much. I'm sorry if I offended people. Actually, I'm not sorry. It's okay. You can take it. Don't go. Don't worry.